Hi, this is Julie Levinsky. I am the Associate Director of Digital for the Christopher and Dana Reed Foundation. I'd like to welcome you all to this month's a webcast with uh, Nurse Linda. She is a leader and provider of rehabilitation nursing for over 40 years. And she is also a blogger for us on our online community in the Ask a Nurse section of our online community. And once a month we are lucky to have her live on these webcasts. So now I will turn it over to Linda. Hi, Linda. Hi, Julie, and thank you. And welcome, everyone. Happy Halloween. It's the last day of the month in October, so just a friendly little reminder. It's time to get those flu shots. If you're not up on your pneumonia uh, vaccinations, be sure and check with your health care provider about that. The weather has certainly changed, and it's that time of year when we need to be thinking about flus, coughs, colds, all those sort of things that are coming. So be sure and protect yourself if you're eligible for those kinds of preventions. Um, today we're uh, very lucky. Once again, we have our friends from Hollister sponsoring the Nurse Linda Web Chat today, and so we'd like to thank them for their sponsorship today as well as their ongoing and continued sponsorship of, of uh, the Christopher and Dana Reed Process Foundation. Um, we're very lucky today uh, to have a guest speaker. I always love it when we have a guest. Bevan Peterson is here with us. She's a nurse patient educator at Craig Hospital. She has a Master's of Science, and she's also a certified rehabilitation registered nurse. Craig Hospital is a big spinal cord injury specialty hospital in Denver, Colorado. And so we're very happy to have Bevan with us today. Hello, Bevan. Hello. Hello. Um, but today we're going to be talking about transitions. And so, uh, you know, people automatically go, and we are going to talk a lot about transition from rehabilitation hospital to home. However, if you think, oh, I've been injured for a while, I, you know, I've been home for a while, don't turn off because all of this information uh, can be uh, translated into people, uh, to helping people who've been home for a while. So it's a good kind of review to look at some of the things. You'll probably learn some new things that maybe you didn't know were available to you or opportunities. So be sure and stay tuned. While we're going through the program, if you have any experiences as a person who's been out in the community for a while of something that you recall when you were transitioning from rehabilitation setting to home, or if you have something that is going on in your life now with transitioning, um, maybe some changes in your condition, um, either um, for better or for worse, different things that you have found. If you'd like to type them into the chat box, we'd like to be sure and put that in. People who have been injured for a while often uh, listen to the web chats, they write into the blogs, but oftentimes they think, oh, well, you know, I, I don't know because I'm the patient. But if you've been injured for a while, you are successful that you're out there navigating the community. So any kind of tips or time savers or experiences that you have had is really uh, valuable to other people because things and experiences that have happened to you are going to be happening to other people. So it's always valuable to hear what kinds of successes you've had or challenges that you've had, and then hopefully if, if we can, we can come up with some ideas for meeting those challenges. So um, again, I'd like to welcome Bevan, and uh, we'll just Bevan. Would you like to tell to tell us a little bit about what you do and what's going on at Craig these days? Sure. So I am the patient and family education coordinator. It's a long title, so I never ask anybody to remember that. Um, but basically what I do is help coordinate all of the education that is going to our patients and families. I also teach education sessions for our newly injured spinal cord injuries. Um, so things like bowel and bladder care, sexual health, skin care, how to get on an airplane. Um, those are the types of things that people will come and sit through classes with me. Uh, also teach some orientations and some welcomes. And then um, am available for one-to-one -one education with people as well. 
And, you know, that's all of that is so important. Um, the thing that I picked up on right away was teaching people to get on and off airplanes because I know mm-hmm. a lot of people travel to get to Craig. And I know a lot of people would maybe like to travel, but they're kind of maybe intimidated about the whole idea of getting on and off the airplane and that kind of thing. So that would be maybe something that people might be interested later on. So let's put a pin in that because we need to talk more about that as we go through. So let's just start at the very beginning. And we have people that are in the hospital and they're um, ready to transition to the home setting. So how, what's the most frequent issue? How do you prepare somebody for making that huge transition from rehabilitation setting where everything is really, you know, it's accessible, it's set up for convenience, there's staff people there that can help you if you've kind of forgotten a little piece of, you know, what the next step is on your bladder program. Um, you know, the equipment just appears when it's time to catheterize. What, how do you prepare people for those transitions from rehab hospital to home? So we're pretty lucky here that we have a big interdisciplinary department, um, but that is one of the biggest challenges is making sure that we do teach people how to be successful initially when they first get home because of exactly what you said, that it's so structured here and we help them with every aspect, but then they do get home and they have to figure out their own routine. So one of the things we work on with people is living a little bit independently per se while they're here so that that last week or two they're hopefully needing a little bit less, Um, but also giving them some checklists and some ideas of things that may potentially come up when they get home. Um, Some of those biggest things that we see are like the equipment being delivered the day that they get home and then who's putting that equipment together, or they get home and they don't have any food in the house because they didn't think about, oh, I'm going to need to eat when I get home this evening. So a lot of it that we're doing is trying to prepare people before they go and make sure all of those pieces are set up. Um, Unfortunately, we learned the hard way a couple years ago that we weren't necessarily setting people up 100% how they should be. And so we've done some programs to work on how to improve that. And the biggest thing we really found was the equipment piece, that people didn't have equipment ready and they were up till 12, 1 in the morning trying to get things put together and exhausted the next day. Um, Or they had their medications all in one bag and didn't really understand how to take all of their meds. And that's Mm -hmm. a big concern when you've been taking the same thing um, for months and then you're going to have to miss a dose because you can't figure it out. Mm -hmm. Um, Yeah, I'm really hearing you say really there's kind of two parts to this whole thing. There's the whole um, rehab piece, the equipment, the medications, getting things set up, getting things organized. And then there's the other piece I heard you say about getting home and having food in the house. And, you know, it it sounds kind of um, uh, elementary, but something that I have seen, not very often, but sometimes I'll see all those things about just going home after being away for a while, like making sure that mm-hmm. you do have fresh food in the refrigerator. Um, one time I I was dealing with a family that, Um, had gone away to a a rehab facility and so while they were gone because they were going to be gone uh, you know several weeks so it was more like going on vacation so they turned the heat way down in the house to make sure that they weren't using a lot of energy because nobody was in the house and so when they came home it was winter time and it was really cold it took a long time for the for the house to warm up again to become a comfortable temperature and sometimes if you know, with spinal cord injury, we all know that tempor- temperature, body temperature regulation is difficult. So it was really quite cold in the house until late into the evening, which caused some problems. So there's getting your house all set up and being ready to go. But then there's this whole bigger piece of all of your new equipment and how things are going to manage and function as well. So even if you're, even if you've been home for a while, these things are kind of good to think about if you go on a trip or if you've been in the hospital for some event or something to make sure that things are still 
working and ready to go when you get back home. So um, what, are, what are some things, uh, Bevan, that you have seen that people are pretty consistently, you've mentioned the equipment. Let's talk a little bit more about that. What kinds of problems do you see with the equipment? So the biggest things that we see with the equipment is things that have to be put together. So somebody gets a commode chair and they need that to do their bowel program or take a shower and that commode chair has come in a box in a bunch of different pieces and hopefully it has the instructions but if not you're trying to figure out what goes where. Um, so that's something that people don't necessarily think ahead of time, how could I get somebody to help me put that equipment together before I get home? Even if it's delivered that same day, could somebody go over earlier in the morning, earlier in the day, and help get that stuff put together? Um, the other equipment piece that we see is that people will get home and they have a hospital bed that they've ordered and it's not there um, mm -hmm. or set up and ready for them. And so then they have to troubleshoot where are they going to sleep or how do they get a bed delivered to them. Um, and often we'll hear if that happens that people tend to be up very late into the night trying to troubleshoot that situation. Um, as far as other equipment, usually when people leave Craig, they're pretty lucky that they get to go home with their wheelchair, but that's not the case for a lot of places. And so sometimes people are getting their wheelchair delivered and they don't even know if they fit in it correctly yet. Mm -hmm. So making sure that they know how to check to make sure all of those pieces are together appropriately before they go trying to go out in the community in that wheelchair or even potentially getting around in the house in that wheelchair. Um, and that that is a really good point because um, in many facilities in on the rehabilitation floor, uh, people get the wheelchair, the therapist will make the recommendations and they'll get the wheelchair and use it in the rehabilitation facility. Sometimes they're able to take that rental chair home with them and sometimes they are not. Sometimes they have to get a, a different one depending on how the payer works. Um, I know that some people have a, a wheelchair that works just great in the rehabilitation setting, but when they get home, it really is not a wheelchair that is, um, that's really convenient to use in their home, especially if people live in uh, mobile homes or apartments. A lot of times people can't, even in any kind of home, the bathroom door's not wide enough. Bathrooms are always way too small uh, for wheelchairs to get around. So that's really kind of a problem is even though you might get the equipment that works great in the facility, it may not be translate to home. So how can people deal with that? How would you be able to prepare and troubleshoot for that? If you get home, would you, you, know, you can take measurements, have somebody take measurements maybe before you go home. I know in many facilities, the uh, therapist will go to the home and take measurements and, and look around and make suggestions for the home to become more accessible. But Bevan, you work in a facility where people are coming from all over the United States, so I imagine the therapist can't fly to other states to do home visits. How do you... How do you make sure you have the best equipment for that particular patient setting? So often what we will do is our therapist will have the patient send in pictures or their family send in pictures of what their home environment looks like or if nothing else, draw up like a blueprint of what the house is like and putting the measurements of doorways on there, the measurements of the bedrooms, so that they can assess before we send somebody home whether or not they are going to fit through those doorways like to get to the bathroom. Um, they do try to go to the houses and if they can when somebody's here they will often do that. We also have um, our case managers get in touch with builders for patients. So if people are able to start contacting some contractors that could give them ideas of what it might cost them um, and what it might take. If they are in a modular home, is that even accessible? Can it handle the weight of their wheelchair depending on if they're in you know, a power wheelchair? Sometimes those homes can't even handle that weight because the flooring isn't sturdy enough. Um, 
So the biggest recommendation is for them to at least look at what the dimensions of the doorways are and the hallways. Um, you want a person to be able to get to their bedroom. But if you at least know going home that you're not going to be able to get down those halls or into the bathroom, what kind of backup plan can you make? Can you do your bowel program in another part of the house? Not ideal, but is it possible to do it that way? Can you have your bed in the living room for a little while until those modifications can be made? Or is there another room in the house that could be turned into the bedroom instead? And we'll hear of people converting their garages or there may be you know, a dining room that's closed off and then they can turn that into a bedroom. Um, I'm trying to think. Those are the major ones. It has to do with just really whether or not a person can afford to get any kind of modifications done because that's a big complication as well. Not everybody has the finances for that. Sure. Yeah. Um, when, yeah, when they don't, we will often try to look into funding resources for people or um, help them look for some accessible apartment living that may be near them. Um, that way they have an alternate plan, um, and if nothing else, they stay in that apartment until their current home can be modified or until they can sell it and find a different one. Um, I think and it, that and it, it, oh oh pardon me no go, go ahead. ahead no go ahead no I was done I'm good <laughs> oh okay <laughs> okay um, so um, I know that you know you mentioned a couple of things about um, you know sometimes the resources the amount of time energy and money it takes to do some modifications can be quite a challenge and so you know you might not be perfectly ready to go you know to have your home ideally set up but like you said you could use some you know put a, put the bed in the living room until you can get things fixed um insurance will not usually pay to have your home modified sometimes they will some policies will but mostly not your homeowner's insurance might be a place you can look there are other places where you can look for funding and but it's not going to come, you know, immediately. You might have to do something temporarily until you can get funding. But there are many organizations in your community where there are people that are willing and happy to help. The uh issue is trying to find those organizations. So if you talk to um, you know, talk to everyone and see what kind of options there are. You can call your uh local um uh, neighborhood representative, uh, your, your t if you live in a town, the mayor. Ask around with different people that belong to different organizations because there are people that like to take up uh, causes or to help people, and they will, you know, they will do that. But finding these right people is, is sometimes difficult. If you belong to a church, sometimes those um, religious organizations, even if you don't belong to the church or if you belong to one, Sometimes they'll pick up, but um, if you you know just call a church and say, "I need a new bathroom remodel," you're probably not going to get very far. You know, the receptionist is not really going to know what to do with that. She might refer you on to somebody. So when you make your first entry call, and if they say, "Well, gee, I really don't know about a program for that," don't be daunted. Just you know, keep at it. Keep calling back. See if you can talk to somebody. Um, you know, within the system, find out how the organization works, if it's like the the Elks Club or the Lions Club, or there's a lot of community organizations that are, are really happy and eager to help you with these kind of things. Um, can you think of any other ways to get funding, Bevan? Um, if I think tapping into um, resources like um, some cities have their own yeah, spinal association. So looking mm -hmm. at your city or your state and seeing if there's a local chapter of some kind of spinal cord injury association where they may have some access to grants or funds or people that are within your local community that do want to reach out and help. Um, I also think that not to toot your guys' own horn, but to looking into things um, at the Christopher Reeves Foundation, 
because you guys do have a lot of resources and a lot of connections and may be able to help point somebody in the right direction. Um, and you know, a little hidden resource in the Christopher and Dana Reed Paralysis Foundation is the peer mentoring program. And a lot of people um, don't really know about this. Um, if you go on the website, you're, you're eventually going to you know, stumble across it. But this is a little hidden gem because what, this, what that particular group does is they'll connect you with people who are living in the community, maybe in your own community, and they've been faced with these problems, and they're able to help guide you with, oh, in, you know, in the city where we live, you can approach this particular group of people, or I uh, got some help from a different organization, and um, they can help kind of streamline some of that um, connections that you need to make to help to um, get some of these private funded resources. You just never know um, what's going to work for you. But the peer mentors are, are very good. Now, you may live in a community where there's not a peer mentor volunteer um, that will be that they'll be able to connect to you in the same uh, city or town where you live. But they'll be able to connect you with somebody who has the same type of injury. Maybe they're in another city. It might work to your advantage because they could say, well, I got some funding from this club. And so then right away you know that you can go to that club or organization in your own town. And, you know, they might be interested in maybe the two um, organizations in each town will talk to each other and, and kind of get some tips and ideas in that way. There's a lot of... Um, unusual things that people do. Um, I see people sometimes um, on the TV where they're talking about maybe um, they have a spinal cord injury from a disease or they were dove into a, a lake and, and had a traumatic spinal cord injury. So they'll go on the news to warn and alert other people, look at what can happen, you know, if you're drinking and driving or if you dive into a shallow lake. And sometimes people will see you on that TV and they'll think, oh, I'll, I'll, I want to help with that. Um, uh, and so they might contribute in that way. So you just never know how things are going to work out. Certainly there are GoFundMe pages now. There are a lot of people that are doing that. So you would want to have something unique about your story that would help, you know, draw people to have interest in you. Those GoFundMe pages are nice because sometimes people would like to donate a little bit of money, but they don't have enough money to fund a whole entire project. So multiple people will get together and fund a particular project. You know, I have a real interesting case. I um, had a patient that actually lived in I want to say it was Kansas, but maybe it was Oklahoma. I think it was Oklahoma. It was one of those big rectangular states out west. Anyway, um, he was a real energetic guy, and he decided he'd start his own business. And part of his business, he felt in his business plan, was to maintain his health. And so what he wanted was some advanced therapies. Now, he did a whole business plan about the business itself, but one subsection was that to maintain his business, he needed to maintain his health. And so he put in some advanced therapies that he needed. He presented his business plan to some organizations. And do you know they funded this? And I think that is just terrific. I mean, what an energetic guy. He did his homework. He found out you know, what the therapies were he needed, why, the, why he needed them, how, he would help, how it would help him, the cost of this. He included it in his major business plan, and he got funding for all of, all of his business ideas and future therapy ideas that were not covered by his private insurance. So you just never know what's going to work out. It's kind of it's kind of interesting when you see some of these things. Now that's a pretty daunting project um, to to do a whole business plan and start a whole business. You know that's that's pretty big. But you know keep keep thinking. Um, I had a family that wanted to send their um, family member from California to a rehab center, but insurance wasn't covering it because they had. Uh, Medi-Cal, which is the Medicaid of California, so they couldn't leave the state. But they had a huge family. They did garage, garage sales, bake sales, and car washes across this whole family for about six months until they got enough money to fund him to go to a spinal cord injury center. So, um, you know, use all of your resources. 
um, you know, something I was thinking, Bevan, too, when you were talking, we talked a lot about inside the house. But another problem that I see people having is that they really didn't think how they're going to get from the rehab center to their home. You know, so if they're in a wheelchair, do they have an accessible van or car to take them? Or can they get into a car? And then how how uh, do they get into the home when they get there? So there might be many steps to get into the home. So, Bevan, how do we plan for people to make that journey to home and to get into the house? And that's a good question. Um, a lot of it is that that work has to be done ahead of time to be able to make those transition the most successful. So unfortunately, things don't necessarily just fall into your lap. You have to do the research and find out what is available in your community. Um, often there is, you know, access a ride or some sort of accessible um, public system that can be given to people, but that does take some time to set up. It can often be six weeks once a person's back home in their state before they will be um, given that. Um, it, often what we'll see is that there are mobility services that you can pay for. Um, there's also some bus systems that are accessible that people can get on that will get them from the airport to home if that's the way that they're getting home or if they're going from the hospital straight to home. Um, but then you're correct as well that you have to be able to even get into those vehicles. Can Did anybody train you how to get tied down so that you're safe when you're on uh, public transportation and your chair's not rocking all over the place? Do you know how to get in using the ramp system? Have you ever done that before where you'll get onto their ramp and then the ramp will lift you up? Um, some stations might have an accessible ramp that you go up that will be level with the train when the doors open or the bus when the, the doors open, but not every place has that. So it is important to think about if you got into that situation, what would you do? Um, and thinking ahead of time really helps with that. Um, when you get home, you if you don't have a level entryway and you do have stairs, that's something that you're going to have to think about ahead of time as well. And sometimes that's part of a person's decision as to whether or not financially they can afford to build those pieces and even go back home. And uh, some people have to look into accessible apartments. But there's a lot of places that make ramps. There's a lot of communities that want to do volunteer services where they can help make ramps. Um, and if you look online, our website, as well as many other websites, I'm sure your website as well, has probably the examples of how to build a ramp and what the height should be and what the dimensions should be to keep you safe. Um, but there are manufactured ones that can already be purchased ahead of time as well. And safety is really the key. Sometimes people want to scrimp a little bit on money and make the ramp a little mm -hmm. steeper or, you know, it, you can't really be too safe. You really need to follow those safety directions for those ramps as well. And, you know, I was um, reading about a new service that um, Uber is starting, and they call it Uber Medical. And so it's people who do have accessible vehicles. Now, it's just starting, so I don't know if it's in every community, and I'm sure it's not yet. But it's people who do have accessible vehicles that are becoming Uber drivers. And so this is going to be, in, you know, Uber's just shaking up the world. Uber left all these uh, app-based uh, shared ride programs. So, you know, keep on, keep on top of that, too, because that could be another opportunity where you get an Uber ride. They will also schedule uh, medical appointments. So if you're going for any kind of treatment, if you're going for treatment for your spinal cord injury to therapy or to your doctor's visits, or um, they do it for any kind of diagnosis. So people who are going to their cancer treatments, you can sign up so that you have your, your ride at the time of your treatment every time. You don't have to reschedule each and every time. So this is a new service that they're offering, and I said, great, it's just another alternative that is, um, you can put that in your uh, plan. I did want to, um, um, there's a comment in the uh, chat box that I did want to bring up about 
Um, oh, let's see. Now I've lost it, but I'll keep looking for it. Um, I did want to bring it up. It was about oh, here's it's a, we were talking about wheelchairs, and the question is, if I have insurance through the workplace, what percentage can I expect insurance to pay towards my new wheelchair? Any thoughts, Bevan? Yeah, that that's a hard one because every insurance mm-hmm. that, uh, plan is going to be different, and so. Mm-hmm. Y- the best way to look into that would be to call your insurance company and talk to the case manager that is assigned to you. It'd probably be a good idea for you to just get a relationship with that person anyway. That way when you do need to call in, they know who you are, you've got this contact with them, they've kind of built a relationship and things might go a little bit smoother. But unfortunately, every single insurance company is going to have a different amount of coverage. And some equipment may or may not be covered even though you need it to be able to have a quality life and get out of bed and and go places. So you're really going to have to reach out to your insurance company and talk to somebody there to find out. Yeah. So I have an insurance policy through my work. Bevan has one through her work, but they could be completely different policies Mm -hmm. and the the benefits. But what Bevan's talking about, that case manager, be sure you have one. If you've been out in the community for a while and you don't have one, just call the number on the back of your card and ask for the case manager. It's your right through your insurance if you have Medicaid no matter what, it's your right to have a case manager assigned to your case. And especially when you have these um, high-use needs for your insurance, it's great to get to know that person, as Bevan was saying, because then they can say, well, you know, I know that you had a, a wheelchair that was purchased for you this many years ago, and so it's time for a new one. And so they can kind of cut through a lot of that red tape, and it's really very helpful. Um, They also sometimes, and, you know, I don't want to put this out there, they're like that they can do this, but sometimes um, if you have a benefit in another bucket of money, sometimes they can move that bucket around. Uh, A lot of people don't realize in the majority of health care policies, certainly not in every one, Uh, there's two weeks of mobility training in your policy. So you have to, you know, ask for your case manager, ask for a copy of your policy. You know, uh, and I'm sure Bevan can attest to this, when people come into the rehab facility, they'll say, don't worry, I have insurance, I'll be fine, I've got insurance to pay for all this. No, you only have the payment for the policy, for what's written in that contract. That policy is a contract with you. And so you only have the benefit that's in your policy. So working with your case manager can kind of help shift some of those funds around sometimes, not always. But, um, and and certainly wheelchairs, you know, uh, after spinal cord injury, you can't just get a wheelchair from the Costco. Um, you know, they're standard for just, you know, mo- moving people from place to place. You need, you know, pressure dispersing cushions and the wheelchair has to be set for you. If you have a spinal cord injury uh, through some kind of um, medical condition like MS or cerebral palsy or um, muscular dystrophy, any of these kind of things, those organizations sometimes have loaner closets and they can help you with supplies as well. The lifetime of a wheelchair that uh, is expected to be used is about 10 years. Is, isn't that correct, Bevan? Yeah, then you will find that if you're trying to get one sooner, you can get quite a bit of a fight back from your insurance company. Mm -hmm. Uh, The other one that I was thinking is that some of the companies that you buy your wheelchairs from, sometimes, not all of them, but they might have a loaner program through them as well where you can use one of their chairs until yours comes in. Um, And that would be for a limited amount of time. But that way, if you're going home before your wheelchair is going to be delivered, you're still going to have a chair until that correct one comes in. And, yeah, so you can get started, and there's various ways to do it, but exactly how much your particular insurance is going to pay is going to come down to what's in your policy. So if you have your policy, you can can look up wheelchairs, and it will 
specifically say, tell you what they're going to do. Now, reading those policies is tedious, wouldn't you say? It can be a real Absolutely. challenge. But the, the more you read it, the more comfortable you become with their language. Um, now, there's another question in here uh, about transitions that's pretty important because, um, well, it's important to me because it's one of my bugaboos. And it's a person who's talking about their medications. And I think it's a person who's been out for a while uh, living in the community because um, they're interested in a program or an app or something where routine meds can be kept on hand by the patient. So this person's writing in that too many times I've been sent home with meds I run out of or need to take with me back to the hospital because the hospital doesn't stock them. And this is a particular bugaboo of mine. It's like that equipment that gets delivered. Sometimes it's set up. And when you get home, oh, the power to the electric bed is not working. Or, you know, people didn't think to test it. They got it all set up. It's plugged in but it's still not working. Um, sometimes with equipment, you know, um, when you're discharged from a hospital, you don't get your medications. Now, maybe at Craig they might do it, but usually the dispensing pharmacy and the hospital pharmacy is two different kinds of pharmacy license. So you don't get your medicine, but you get this long list of medications. If you can call ahead of time and talk to the pharmacist, don't just talk to the person who answers the phone, because they don't really have control over ordering the medicine. You have to talk to the pharmacist and tell them these are the medications you'll be be on when you get home because this is a bit, this is just this just drives me insane. It doesn't matter if you have a spinal cord injury or if you're discharged from the hospital for whatever reason and you need a particular medication that's not normally stocked in your local pharmacy. They might not be able to get that medicine for 3 days. If you're a person that needs that medication to control your spasms and you have to wait three days, you're going to be awfully miserable. You might even go into some sort of withdrawal depending on what the medication is. You don't really have three days to wait for it. So you want to be sure that medication is in the pharmacy ready for you when you pick it up on the day that you go home. Now, Bevan, why don't insurance companies I – know, I know this is a, this is a um, – a question, it's more rhetorical, but why don't payers allow you to pick up your medicine a few days early? I don't know, but they don't. Do you know of any that do? Um, you know, we do sometimes help people get their medications the day before they go home. Usually mm -hmm. it's delivered the day of. So there are some places that can arrange that you could pick them up a couple days early, um, but it often is a relationship between the hospital and that pharmacy that has figured out how to allow that happen. Um, mm -hmm. That way they're not being double charged for medications and and pieces like that. Um, to kind of jump back to what you were saying about the medications in the hospital, one thing that people could look into is seeing if they can bring their own medications in, have the pharmacy take control of those meds, and then they can dispense those medications so that the person won't go without meds. Now, not every facility will let you do that, um, but we are lucky here that if a person has a specific medication that they're on and we don't stock it and it'll take us a few days, we can prescribe and give the patient's medication, but the pharmacy has to be in control of it and they have to double check to make sure it really is what they say it is um, and those pieces. Patients can't keep their medications in their room with them. Um, and that's mostly because we wouldn't want somebody to take medications that might interact with each other or, you know, overdose on something because we've given them some and somebody else is giving them some as well. And that includes over-the-counter too, right? Correct, yes. Yeah. Even if it was Tylenol, I mean, that's a multivitamin maybe um, that there's a specific brand you like. We would have to still do the same thing where we are the people that dispense it. And you have to be very careful about those over-the-counter medications because they do interact sometimes with your prescription medications. So you don't mm -hmm. want to be 
counteracting something or have a complication because you didn't tell somebody that you're taking an over-the-counter. Now, I don't think that anybody minds that you take an over-the-counter. They just need to know so that you can be aware of any contraindications of that. Sometimes food, too, can affect uh, the functions of your medications. So you Mm -hmm. need to be aware of all of of those uh, little details. That's why you need to let people know exactly what you're taking. Now, something we haven't yet uh, broached, but on on the same topic, either if you're just going home or later on, is um, obtaining care providers. So what kind of quality should a person uh, look for in finding a care provider? I feel, are you talking a home care provider or like a primary care physician? Oh, a home care, somebody to help you. A home care provider. Yeah. Yeah, so sometimes people's insurance will cover an agency. Um, What I do like about agencies is that you are guaranteed to have care. Um, So if somebody called in sick, they would have to replace that person. Um, But unfortunately, you don't always have the same person every day, so you could be teaching a different person. Um, The best thing I think that you can do is interview that person. I would look into, if you're you're hiring privately, interview them. Um, I would absolutely call their resources and see what their resources or their references, I guess, have to say about them. Um, because sometimes we don't always know what we're really getting into. They may look great on paper and may look great uh, when you meet them, but then you find out, well, that person really doesn't show up three days of the week, and so you wouldn't want to have that. Um, Looking to see what their experience is is really important. Uh, If you know your own care, you absolutely can educate somebody and teach them how to do it, but sometimes having somebody that comes in that may have taken care of somebody else with a spinal cord injury is um, really helpful as well. Or often you'll see a person who had a family member that's had um, some kind of injury or disease like MS or muscular dystrophy that's given them some experience working with people who need the type of help that you need. Um, A lot of it's gonna be your personality meshed with their personality. And over time, you're going to kind of figure out what type of person you really like taking care of you because you may be really laid back, and if that person's uptight, then you two probably aren't going to mesh. Um, so that's another thing that, that you, to look into, but that one's a little bit harder because you do have to get to know them and yourself a little bit first. You know, and I think another thing is if you hire somebody, hire them for a limited amount of time. Tell them you're going to try it out for six weeks or three months, whatever, but put a limit on it. So at the end of the time, you can say, no hard feelings, but this just really isn't working out for me. If you hire somebody and now you're going to be my full-time attendant or you're going to be coming in so many days a week and there's no trial period, it's it's a little more challenging um, to say, you know, this is really not working out. So, you know, to put it right up there out front that I'd like to try this for six weeks, two months, just some kind of something so at the end you could say, you know, it's just not really working out or this is going great, let's go on with it. I think that's important. Now, I know, uh, Bevan, you have some programs at Craig that help people um, in the community uh, for transitions and doing um, finding care and uh, talking to people, would you like to share those with us so that people will know how to get a hold of uh, these programs that are available to everyone? Yeah, so our biggest one is that we have a nurse advice line, uh, and their number is on our website, and I can put it on, have you guys put it on this webinar as well, but we have nurses that are licensed in all 50 states, and they have a database and done some research um, on what is available for people in different areas, as well as they can give you tips on how to talk to people. So if you have a question on how uh, to interview, they potentially will have some recommendations for you and some questions that you can ask. Um, And then they can also tell you when they feel like you need to go on and find more care 
than you are receiving. So if you called in and you weren't sure if you were having you know, a medical issue, they could tell you, okay, yeah, you really do need to go see your doctor right now. Um, or they can give you questions to ask your doctor so that you know exactly what you want um, to find out from them and you know the way to ask those appropriately. Um, I feel like I steered off your question a little bit. Oh, the, any kind of uh, programs. Don't you have a soft landings program also? We do. So that one's not open to um, people within the community. It's only for our new patients. Um, and the soft landing was actually a study that we did. And uh, we ha we're, well, we sent um, some staff home, and they evaluated what the challenges were that people were seeing when they first got home. They then brought that back and we worked on areas that really needed to be improved so that people were having a smoother transition home. Because um, we didn't necessarily know what we didn't know since we teach them so well here, but we're not there when they get home and in that structured environment. And so that's when things were kind of falling apart and we were seeing people struggle. Um, and that was very successful. So recently, we uh, created a program called Supported Discharges. And that is where we have one staff member assigned to that role for sure. Sometimes we'll send a therapist along. But she goes home with people um, who are just discharging and their team has identified that they have the need for extra support for those first few days. And so she gets to go home with them and kind of help them through that initial process. So if equipment isn't put together, how can they troubleshoot that together? If there isn't food at the house, how do they, you know, how do they troubleshoot all of those pieces? Um, sometimes we've actually sent her out a couple weeks after a person goes home because we knew they would transition well into the home, but we weren't sure how they would transition into the community. So then she went out there and was able to help them get connected with different organizations in their community or their local rec center or um, adaptive equipment places. Um, sometimes it's getting on and off the transport system in their area because it's different than what they'd experienced here. Um, it's been really beneficial and we would love to give it to every single patient because then we would know that every person gets a successful transfer home. Um, but we've really been able to make some improvements and help some people with that transition and make it a lot less stressful when they first go home. And those are all very helpful things. So Craig has a lot of information on their website. There's a lot of information on the Christopher and Dana Reeve website. Um, we do have some comments from some listeners. And um, uh, Leo comments that you might consider mentoring. Do not let pride get in your way. So I, you know, this is from a listener, which I think is very important. Uh, it's much more difficult to uh, get what's offered to you once you've denied it to yourself. So a uh, good comment from that person, especially early on. So sometimes people think, oh, I, I should be able to do this. You know, I, I've been educated about this. I've been to the rehab hospital, and I should become this uh, super person. And, you know, we all find that there are things, and it's, it's sometimes it's not the big things, but it could be little things that just get in the way of, you know, how do I really navigate in the kitchen cooking while I'm in my chair and moving things around. So those are really important things uh, to ask. Um, I really appreciate Leo's comments in here about um, the time of the year with insurance can make a big difference too when you ask for something. So when the new year starts, um, some of your benefits will uh, re, uh, reinitiate. So uh, all these kind of things are very helpful, and it's very helpful if you have um, a an, an case manager through your payer system that will be there and advocate for you. They're really on your side to be able to get as many benefits as you can possibly get. They're there to provide that quality of care. Now, um, uh, oh, another thing, too, I wanted to mention is when you are uh, at home, 
be sure you notify uh, the paramedics around your that service your area. Uh, the firehouse, you can just call there and talk to people and say, you know, I'm, I'm uh, newly injured. I've just returned home, so that they they will actually flag your house. So if say you are ventilatory dependent, it's really important. If the power co- goes out, they will have your uh, house flagged, so that they will come and help you with uh, ventilatory assistance. Or the telephone, they can notify the telephone company. You can notify the telephone company so that they will restore power to your house quickly. Um, so be sure and no, notify them so that they know there's uh, people there. Um, there. In many communities, there's a new thing that's being started called the Community Paramedic Program that they will come and check your blood pressure. They will come and do some of those uh, medical task-oriented kind of things. There's a fee for it. So you need to think about that, but they will come and do some of these things that will help. Now, since we have Devin on the phone and we're running short of time, there are two questions that are not really related to transitions, but since we have Devin on the phone, these are going to be important questions. So somebody has written in and they want to know if there's SEI treatment centers which specialize in restoring proprioception. And so this is for a C3 Asia D patient. Um, so, uh, Bevan, do you have programs at Craig specifically for proprioception? I just find it's with regular uh, spinal cord injury therapy treatment. Do you have something unique that you're doing? You know, we don't have specific program for that. It is part of mm-hmm. their occupational therapy and working on those pieces. We do have some nice equipment um, that is electronic that's helping with things like that. Um, But we don't have a program that is just specific for that. And I am not aware of programs um, for that um, in the community, and at least around here. Mm -hmm. And well, and and you are the spinal, one of the spinal cord injuries top specialty areas in the country, but proprioception is such a huge problem, knowing where your body is in space and, and restoring that, but getting those, some, uh, it does fit into the general program. It's not like we we're just going to work on proprioception, but they're also going to work on strengthening and corrective measures for if you do find that you've um, uh, fallen over or, or you find yourself kind of lost in in space where your body is uh, because of lack of sensation. So it is all a part of the bigger plan. But I appreciate that question because that is um, really thinking very deeply and critically about, you know, if you could correct proprioception, boy, you've corrected a lot of issues. So that's really great. Um, There's a couple Mm -hmm. of other things, and then I just want to just make a couple of comments here. Um, There's a person who's uh, C34 uh, canal stenosis who's incomplete. They want to know the recovery time. And I will tell you that that is not something that we can predict. That's individual for everyone depending on, uh, it's, it says it's a traumatic injury. And so we need mm-hmm. to know, um, you know, you should talk to your pri- your healthcare provider about that. It looks like you've had surgery. Maybe talk to the surgeon about that. Uh, because that's going to be so unique to every single person. I wish we had an answer that was it will take exactly this long. Everybody would love to hear that answer, uh, but we just really don't know that. It's so unique to every individual person. Um, there's a person asking for a health checklist. We're working on that, so keep uh, looking at the blog, and um, we'll be seeing that coming up pretty soon. And then there's this really important question, and I want to get uh, Bevan's uh, input on this as well. And the question's from Judy, and she wants to know, um, she's been a quadriplegic for seven years. She's 42 years old. She's starting to move, lose movement in her fingers, then her hand, then her wrist then her lower arm, and this has happened over the last two weeks. It's creeping up towards her upper arm, and her MRI shows nothing. Now, the first thing that I think of when I hear this story is I think of a syrinx, um, mm-hmm. you know, which, which is uh, a tr- something that needs to be treated right away. But the syrinx, ha- if it is a syrinx, it has not yet shown up on the MRI. Now, the first thing I think of is syrinx, and probably, Bevan, you're in the same 
report with me. Um, yeah. So you want to be sure and have this monitored very carefully. Now, because we're in spinal cord injury, we're, our minds are automatically going to go there. It doesn't mean that you couldn't have a pinched nerve in your arm, like a carpal tunnel right. or mm-hmm. something else. You know, so we we shoot over right to the big things, and sometimes we'll just kind of dismiss other things. Um, you know, that just because you have a spinal cord injury doesn't mean you couldn't have something like a, a carpal tunnel the same as anybody else could have. Um, so sometimes Absolutely. we shoot right over those. But um, do you want to talk about syrinx a little bit? Um, well, and, and I can. And so after a spinal cord injury, especially years later, some people can develop scarring, um, and the scarring can take away some of the sensation that people have. So that was one of the things. It's called tethering of the cord. And then searings can be builds up build up in certain areas um, or cyst development within the spinal canal or the spinal cord, and that's causing pressure on an area, and therefore you're losing the function because of where that pressure is. Um, I don't feel that every physician is, knows exactly what to look for. Um, I think it would be important or a good idea to get a second opinion. Um, and the opinion may be the exact same thing, that they don't see anything wrong. But it doesn't hurt just to double check and make sure that one person isn't seeing something that maybe the other person didn't quite know to look for. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And, and even if you specifically go and say, doctor, I'm worried about syrinx or I'm worried about scarring, Sometimes that will trigger something, you know, if they don't, if they're a physician that does not see a lot of individuals with spinal cord injury, that might not be the first thing that pops into their head like it would in ours. You know, and mm-hmm. it's not, it's not, it's not bad, it's not wrong, it's just that, you know, people come from different backgrounds and treatments. But I think that is an excellent idea if you're worried, always ask for a second opinion Everybody has the right to that. Your insurance will pay for a second opinion. Um, so, again, talk to that case manager and Zoom. You can get a second opinion pretty quickly. So these are all important things to think about. Um, we're just about to the top of the hour, and so I would uh, really like to express my thanks uh, to you, Bevan, for uh, joining us today. Your wealth of information has just been fabulous. And so it's just a pure joy to talk to you. And I know that our listeners enjoyed your comments as well. Uh, we'd like to thank Craig Hospital for um, your support in allowing you to come here today and and be a part of this and, and the support that Craig offers the Christopher and Dana Reeve Paralysis Foundation as well. And again, thank you to our friends at Hollister for their continued support. So with that, I will sign off, and thank you very much for listening and coming in, and uh, we'll hear you next month. Remember, if you have any questions, if we didn't get to your question today, I am on the blog uh, tonight from 7 to 8 Central Time. Um, And then also we have the webinars every month at the same time, and uh, there's a new blog every week. So if you have any questions, um, feel free to write into the blog. You can, uh, you know, just write in whatever question you want, and I usually answer them uh, pretty much as they come in. Um, so that that's a pretty quick response there too. So thank you very much for everybody for participating. Again, thank you, uh, Bevan. It was delightful to have you, and we'll thank talk you to you again. And, yeah. Well, hopefully we'll do it again. <laughs> Sounds fun. That would be great. All right. Thank you, everybody. Thanks for listening. Goodbye.